So, gotcha, on the X. So, um, being a prior military person, asking me to stand on an X is a little bit, <laughs> got a little bit of trepidation about that. But whatever, I have no sense of self-preservation anyway, so. Um, so first I'd like to start out by saying thank you very much for having me here. I'm really honored and, and uh, humbled to be speaking in front of this audience today. It's, um, it's really great. But um, yeah, so in 2005, I finished my bachelor's and I did what any level-headed, reasonable college grad would do and I enlisted in the military. Brilliant choice. It actually turned out really, really well. Um, I got to work with some of the most amazing organizations in the military, some of the most elite units in special operations, some of the most fantastic, unbelievable tactical operators that you could ever possibly meet. And I learned so much from these guys, tons. In fact, one of the main things I learned from them was what really separated a great operator from a good operator. And what I realized was the difference was that the great ones were able to perform under stress. Really, really interesting. They were able to apply different cognitive and psychological tools and actually control their physiology. They were able to perform, complete the mission when the chips were down and the deck was stacked against them, no matter what. They were able to make it happen. These guys were incredible. They were able to stay cool, calm, and collected in some of the most dangerous and hazardous environments you could possibly imagine. They were able to adapt, improvise, and overcome despite tremendous, tremendous adversity. They were able to kind of peer through the haze of combat and see through the fog of war, and they were able to find this cognitive path through chaos. And the interesting thing is, I think we can do the same thing. In fact, I would submit to you, in the case of uh, of resuscitation, similar things are true. That uh, in the ICU, in the emergency department, uh, on the street, on the battlefield, what separates a really great resuscitationist from everybody else is this ability to kind of keep their composure. To, in the, when, when faced with this decompensating critically ill or critically injured patient, put the pieces of the puzzle together and make things happen. And I think one of the key concepts to this is this idea of flow. It's a concept that was proposed by a psycho uh, psychologist named Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, Mihai. And you have to forgive me, my Hungarian's a little sketchy, but it's about as best as you're going to get from me. And uh, what he suggested is there's this optimum level of performance, this, this state of being where you perform at a higher level. And to give it a, a clinical reference, it's... Um, it's like when you're treating this really sick patient and, and things just kind of start to go well. Everything starts to click. You're in the zone. The somehow, somehow, the, the pieces of this clinical puzzle kind of stand out to you and you're able to put things together. You're able to perform relatively complex, demanding skills relatively easily. It goes quickly and efficiently despite some bumps in the road. What's more is you have this, this, this spike of, of creativity, of innovation. You, you, you remember things you learned a while ago and you put them together with things that you saw yesterday and the day before and you're able to synthesize new, novel, reasonable and safe, but novel uh, modalities to address the pathology in front of you. And perhaps what's coolest is you feel good. It makes you happy. You get excited, you get a thrill out of it and you're like, yeah, that's why I do what I do. So that is really interesting. So if you break it down into two of the constituent variables, what I want to look at is skill, so your ability to do stuff, and challenge, or, or rather, more specifically, your perception of the challenge and the difficulty. And that's what I want to focus on today. I want to focus on this y-axis, and we're going to talk about specific ways that you can regulate your uh, level of arousal, and you can uh, essentially maintain the momentum of this flow for the duration of a resuscitation. You can bring yourself down, bring down that level of challenge and perceived difficulty and hit this flow track. So that's great. The concept is a little uh, nebulous. It's a little vague. But let's get down to brass tacks. I think there's three things that we can do to achieve flow. Preparing, 
engaging and disengaging. Preparing, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, because it's the subject of an entire another lecture set conference day, uh, number one. And number two, um, when it comes to the, the clinical skills and things you need to learn to prepare, the information, the education, et cetera. So I'm in year one. We're like brachial plexus level right now, OK? Um, and I'm a flight paramedic, but I'll defer to clinical masters and physicians that are way smarter than me and way more experienced than me to prescribe what that road actually looks like. But what I do want to talk about is engaging and disengaging. And to me, this is sort of like the yin and the yang. This is the Tao of how you control yourself during resuscitation. So engaging. You know, uh, we, went through, we went through this selection program that was about 10 weeks. We started with 72 guys and six graduated. And it didn't get much easier from there. In fact, I failed out of dive school. Uh, it was, you know, a lot is expected of you. You think you're squared away. You think you're ready to rock and roll, and you fail, and you feel like crap. Now, I remember getting out of the pool wet, cold, tired, exhausted, completely dejected, and I was packing up my things. One of the instructors said something really interesting to me. He said, you know, dive school is about learning to swim against the tide up here. He said, you have to learn to engage this to control this. And that really, really stuck with me. So I spent the next month and a half, well, I spent the first couple of days drinking, and then after that, <laughs> the next month and a half, I spent doing a lot of training, Physically, physical training, yeah, but actually trying to teach myself different psychological tools to like keep my heart rate down, stay focused in these really difficult situations. And since then, I've adapted this tool we call BTS, it was originally BTSF, Beat the Stress Fool. And since talking to Scott, I threw in the P, so beat the stress foolish Padawan is what we like to call it now. And uh, so this is how it goes. This is the tool. So you start out by controlling your breathing, focusing on your breathing. And uh, actually, you can get an app for it, believe it or not, called the Tactical Breather. And what tactical breathing essentially is, is this controlled respiratory cycle where you breathe in for four seconds, Hold it for four seconds. Exhale for four seconds. And then hold it out for four seconds. And if you don't like the term tactical breathing, if that's a little too militaristic for you, you can call it resuscitation breathing. You can call it whatever you want. It doesn't really matter. And if you do three seconds instead of four, I don't think that makes a big difference either. The point is to use a conscious mechanism for controlling what's otherwise an autonomic function and managing your heart rate. Talk, positive self-talk. You have to believe that you can do it. You have to believe that you can help this person, and then you have to tell yourself that. You, know, you have to sit there and essentially tell yourself, maybe a lot of, not out loud, you may sound a little schizo, but um, you can tell yourself internally, hey, I, you know, this person's really sick. I need to step up to the plate. I need to make this happen. I can do this. I've done this before. You say that to yourself over and over again. In fact, you can choose your own mantra. You can make it specific. So if, you, if you're going in to manage an airway, it can be, you know, you can pull stuff from Levitan. You can pull stuff from other people. Tell yourself, ear to sternal notch, no DSAT, O's to the nose, whatever you want to do. But you tell yourself, you feed yourself that positive information. Next is seeing. Visualizing is an incredibly powerful tool. Essentially what you're doing is before you go to put in a chest tube, before you go to instrument and airway, whatever it is, you're actually seeing the steps of the procedure as you're prepping to do them. And in fact, if you add in, the more sensory stimuli you add into your little vivid imagination as you rock out in the ED, um, what it feels like to hold the laryngoscope in your hand, what it feels like to uh, incise the chest, all that stuff. If you include that, it makes it even more powerful. And in fact, from a neurological standpoint, uh, it's essentially like doing a practice run before you actually do the procedure. Incredibly helpful. Focus. So this is about using a trigger word. And uh, essentially what you can do is you can, <laughs> you can build this... Uh, uh, over the top, man. It was a great, great movie. It was the A of the B movies. Um, and uh, what you do is you develop this word that transitions you psychologically from the preparatory phase to an action phase when you actually do stuff. And there's, there's more than one uses for this, and I, I'll probably talk about the, uh, another one here shortly. 
And finally, posture. You know, I never thought about this total, you know, like mind-blowing concept when Scott brought this one up. I watched the TED Talk by Amy Cuddy and then read a couple things. And actually what I did was a totally not randomized, totally uncontrolled uh, uh, review of different uh, professional athletes, musicians, military personnel, competitive shooters to look at how they actually hold themselves, how they actually physically present themselves in space before they actually perform. And it's very interesting. Almost all of them take on some sort of power pose, this, this open, wide kind of body position. And at least Cuddy's research shows when it comes to uh, interviews, people actually perform better. They have increased levels of certain circulating hormones that tend to increase their confidence or, or their perceived ability to be successful in the interview. So posture, how you actually hold yourself in space can be important to this too. So you guys might have heard us talk a little bit about this in the podcast, and maybe you've read some of the stuff that I've thrown out there. But I have a confession to make, and that was I was holding back a little. That was only half the story. Here's the other half. So I came back from a deployment, and I was talking to this buddy of mine, and I was explaining to him about this really uh, rough mission that we had been on uh, to rescue 12 guys that had crashed in a helicopter. And uh, we were on the ground operating for about 80 minutes, plus or minus, but it seemed like an eternity. And toward the end, it was really interesting. I noticed that I became distracted really easily. Dealing with all the sensory input and having to make all these decisions, it was actually really draining. It's fatiguing from a cognitive standpoint. And when I told him about this, he said, yeah, you know what, it's interesting. When you have to run a mental marathon, you have to be sharp the whole time. When you have to go the distance, he said, most people think about, most people think it's what you do or the decisions you make. And he said, I think what's equally important is what you don't do. And I was kind of like, what? And he said, it's how you manage the time, the seconds and the minutes that perforate all that action that can be equally useful. And that's what engaging or disengaging is about. If engaging is about hitting this ideal level of arousal where you can function, where you're psyched up, you're ready to go, but not too stressed out and over anxious, Disengaging is about stepping back and taking little breaks so that you're able to go the distance and maintain that pace. So taking a break. So you move to this position or you get at a position where you can actually take a little mental break. So from a clinical standpoint, this is why preparation is so important, why, doing, why having all these skills uh, essentially ingrained into your muscle memory is important because clinical example. So um, I'm still flying for our critical care transport service. And uh, what we, how we carry our pressors, for example, is they're all in a condensed form. They all come in vials. We don't carry anything pre-mixed because that would be a lot of volume and be a lot of weight to put on the aircraft. It takes up a lot of space. So whenever I, I got to go mix up some Levo. Okay, so the first thing I think is drug, dosage, dil uh, solution, dilution, right? I got norepinephrine, four milligrams, going into 250, that gives me 16 mics per cc. All right, once I check that, the, the process of drawing up the drug and putting it in the bag and then uh, you know, prepping the line and whatnot, that's, that's a very low cognitive load skill, especially when you've done it a lot. Gowning up, another lo relatively low cognitive load skill if you've done it a bunch of times. So you use that, you use that time to essentially empty your mind for a second or two and take a deep breath. So you almost stop thinking and step back. And then you immediately enter back into that engage phase again. So you take a deep breath, step back. All right, line's almost good. Now, go back into your tactical breathing, visualize what the next step is, use your trigger word and make it happen. The other piece is learning how to disengage from distraction and certain troubles. So this is Alexandre Bilodeau. He's a um, He's from Montreal. He's a French-Canadian uh, freestyle skier. And he won a gold medal in the moguls, um, two Olympics running, which is unheard of. Uh, but if you watch him or any other mogul skier for that uh, matter, blaze down this trail. This picture doesn't do it justice. But there's these like VW-sized um, mounds of snow. And these guys are blazing down it. And if you watch them in action, their legs act as a shock absorber. 
And if you think about it, that's really important to have that ability to cognitively absorb problems and to absorb different bumps and shocks in the road. I mean, imagine driving down Madison at, at the 40 miles an hour with no shocks on your car. It'll jar the teeth out of your skull. So what you have to do is build in this, this mental shock absorber. And essentially how you do it is you're having problems, you're running into issues, and you, know, you want to throw the needle to the rear scope across the room. You just step back for a second take a deep breath, and then you use your trigger word again and re-engage and get back in the fight. But the idea is to not let it throw you off because it, be, it can be distracting, it can be confusing, and what's worse, negative thoughts can start to penetrate your brain, right? You can start to think, oh man, last time I really messed this up in front of the attending, last time I really had a problem with this, last time so-and-so made fun of me, whatever. You need to get rid of that. Finally, stepping back all together. You can actually move back to what some people call a cognitive rally point or, or resuscitation stop point or, or whatever you want to call it. And if I'm working with my partner and things are kind of going crazy, things aren't really adding up, what we'll do is I'll have he, he or her manage what's going on around the bed and then I step back and talk to the physician or the PA and be like, so wait, 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 what, what, what was going on again? Let's start from the top. Let's realize that we're, we might be going down the rabbit hole here and take another look at things. So actually stepping back completely uh, is very helpful too. So two days from now, two weeks from now, two months from now, this is what I want you guys to remember, engaging and disengaging. This is the AC power that's going to bring you and drive you into that flow track and allow you to stay on the path through chaos. So I think this stuff is fascinating. I think human factors in, in, in resuscitation or in the military or wherever is, is absolutely intoxicating. And um, the, the cognitive and non-cognitive factors that we've sort of lumped into uh, human performance in resuscitation I think is, is uh, really, really interesting as well. And I think we're just now scraping the surface. We're just tapping into this tremendous potential for improvement. And I don't think we have anywhere close to all the answers. Um, I think we still need to do some formal investigation. We need to demonstrate some, some outcomes, some, some outcome benefit to a lot of this stuff. But I think it's worth it. And I think it's important because we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to our colleagues, and we owe it to our patients to perform at our very best every single day. Thank you very much.